so I will try not to go too long. Um, so I will today talk about the evolution of the shape of the diffusion gradient wave from mainly really drawing from my own personal research and my own personal experience. So our standard sequence for the diffusion MRI has been really stasteful and tanner for the last many, many years. And uh, that sequence has taken other names as well, like a pulsed, uh, spin, uh, pulsed gradient spin echo sequence, like the PGSC, or as a recently the single diffusion encoding uh, sequence uh, as uh, from publication by Shamish et al. in 2016. So this is a really beautiful sequence. Uh, it's readily available. It exists uh, on most scanners, clinical and free clinical. It's very simple. It has only three uh, diffusion parameters to control. It's very interpretable. The theory is well established and it's relatively easy to do. So then why then investigate new sequences and why investigate uh, uh, different gradient waveforms? So there was some of the work from Kalagan and Stepishnik. Um, there was uh, the whole new theory about temporal diffusion spectroscopy and the oscillating gradients. And the group I go uh, took that up and they were showing uh, really nice results uh, uh, like uh, mapping out the diffusion spectrum using oscillating gradients. Also there was the sequences like these chirp sequences by Kirluta from 2008 and also the diffusion, um, the double diffusion encoding sequence which was also uh, quite um, interesting and it was like providing information about microscopic anisotropy for example which uh, all the SDE sequence couldn't provide before. So all of these different sequences were adding new information uh, and were providing different kind of information from the sequence, uh, the, the original uh, stars container sequence. So around that time, um, I think Daniel Alexander has been thinking a lot about sequences and optimization of the experiment design. Uh, he's been thinking about uh, what are the best ways of doing microstructure imaging and what are the best ways of doing the acquisition in microstructure imaging. So he's, uh, uh, in, um, as Gary mentioned earlier in one of the talks, he's introduced this novel kind of active imaging framework in which the whole process of imaging, starting from the question that you want to ask to the acquisition and uh, the parameters that you want to estimate, uh, everything could be like optimized in this uh, really nice automated way using objective functions. Uh, he's got the leadership fellowship for this in 2008 um, and uh, he then employed uh, two postdocs. Uh, one was Gary Zhang uh, who was supposed to develop through the modeling work he was doing and me to work on the sequences itself and to try to actually optimize and improve the sequences. So when I came to UCL, it was in 2009, uh, I was a postdoc. I've just finished my PhD at Oxford. I was uh, uh, based in FEMRIB, which is the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Center of the Brain. Uh, and for my PhD, I was actually working in MRI. I was doing simulations of MRI, and I've not really done any diffusion MRI before that. So it was my first uh, postdoc with Danny in 2009. And when I came, Danny said, OK, this is the question. So what are the ideal gradient waveforms that we want to use to measure microstructure parameters in diffusion MRI? So I made this plot, I put it two question marks, and I said, okay, so what do we do now? So first thing I did was uh, I discretized the whole gradient waveform and I just plotted it like all these different points and then uh, decided to try to optimize the whole waveform and each of these points independently. And in that process gave me the biggest flexibility because then I could get like any kind of shape uh, that was required for that particular uh, application or optimization that I wanted to do. So in order to be able to compute the diffusion MRI signal from these generalized gradients because these sequences could take any shape and any form, I had to actually um, implement a computational method to, to um, calculate the signal. And at the time, I mean, there were these amazing papers by Callaghan and then Sarah Coden Callaghan, and it also actually earlier on started also from uh, Stepishnik uh, about methods for actually solving these uh, generalized gradient waveforms. Uh, and so this is this matrix method computation. And uh, in 2009, in February, I emailed Paul Callaghan and I said, hi, I'm new in this field and I would really like to be able to simulate diffusion MRI of these generalized waveforms. Do you maybe still have the code? <laughs> of 
Paul Callaghan responded and says, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I really can't find my code. Why don't you email uh, Sarah? <laughs> she still has the code. So I emailed the Sarah code, uh, and, um, and uh, she emailed back, and she sent me a few lines of code and some instructions. And uh, so I started from there. So the code, I couldn't really use the, uh, the, the few lines of the code that she sent me. It was written in a different language, and it was actually much easier to start everything from scratch. So I took the paper by Sarah Code and Callaghan in the previous work, and I started implementing the matrix method, uh, method um, by myself uh, using all these algorithms. I then um, extended it to like three dimensions and included some numerical approximations to make it faster so that actually then it's possible for me to do the optimizations and to have enough speed for do the optimizations because they required lots and lots of computation. So then what I did is I wanted to optimize uh, these sequences, uh, but the goal I had in mind was to improve the sensitivity to microstructure parameters, and for that I needed to have a model of microstructure. And in the at the time, the most standard model was the Charnt model by uh, Yaniv. And so I just uh, embraced that model. Um, it was a simplified version because it had only single radius and two compartments, uh, hidden the restricted diffusion. And then I decided to optimize the sequence to maximize sensitivity to the radius, to the diffusion constants, and to the restricted volume fraction. So the way I did the optimization, uh, was using this experiment design optimization, which was initially set up by Danny, uh, in which given a tissue model and a pulse sequence model, we minimize this objective function f, which in essence maximizes the uh, accuracy we have on these parameter estimates. So really what it was doing was just minimizing the posterior distribution on these four parameter estimates of the model. So uh, I started off I had these, uh, my first initial guess for these uh, generalized waveforms was just this uh, kind of like a random, uh, here you see a sample of points. I chose, uh, you know, I had four measurements. I chose to have four measurements. And then uh, the, the, the iterative process, you know, after step one, step two, until, you know, step n, until f reaches some minimum point. And at that point, the optimization algorithm would stop and I would get my optimal waveforms. So the results that I got from these optimizations are very interesting. So for this is here an optimized uh, four me uh, independent measurements for axon diameter of 0 0.5 microns. And what you see here in this uh, first on the left uh, plot, you see this wave is just a half of this generalized waveform. And the other half I just chose to be a mirror image of the first. So the, when I optimized for one micron to maximize sensitivity to one micron, then I got these oscillations. Then for two microns was these, and three microns, and then five microns. So for me, as a starting in this field, in like one year in, this was so amazing. I was so uh, pleased to see that from something that was nothing, just like a waveform full of points, you can get something that has any shape. And it was also very nice to see that this shape had a certain trend. And that, for example, for the small uh, axon diameters, there was a much higher frequency. And as these axon diameters was increasing, the frequencies was de decreasing. So I immediately assumed that we need high frequency OGSCs to measure small axons, and we need low frequencies to measure uh, large axons. And was I wrong? <laughs> Uh, I extended this optimization framework then into three dimensions as well because I wanted to see whether there's any benefit in actually varying the angle of the gradient waveform throughout one pulse sequence. And in a very similar process, I got results uh, which were similar to the 1D results previously. So in the XY plane, which is perpendicular to the fibers, I also got a very similar pattern of these oscillations from high frequency to low frequency. However, in the, in the Z direction, which is parallel to the fibers, I got no oscillations, which is kind of what we expected. I did not discover any particular um, uh, um, curve in time or like particular benefit of changing the angles of this generalized waveform. The only benefit was just having these kind of particular oscillations 
in perpendicular direction and, no, and, and nothing too particular in the z direction. I then looked at the objective function and I found that the, actually these generalized waveforms and they optimized, they were providing an order of magnitude lower uh, objective function than the standard PGSC. Also, when I looked at the estimates, the accuracy and precision of axon diameter and other parameters that I had in the, in the model, I found that um, the new uh, sequences, the optimized sequences, are providing much better estimates than the PGS as well. <coughs> we also experimentally validated this, implemented these really crazy waveforms uh, on our preclinical scanner, and we managed to ma uh, really uh, establish an excellent match between the simulation predictions and uh, the exper experiments. We then used some phantoms, and we also found and we reproduced the same results that we had um, on the axon diameter. Uh, in order to be able to use this, uh, then to just fit it into like a whole human brain or something, wherever, like I just thought, okay, now we just need to parameterize them. We hit, see these are these square waveforms. Uh, they are still quite slow to use on like the whole kind of brain when there's lots of lots of voxels you want to fit in. So I thought, let's just parameterize the waveform and then the process will Im improve uh, and it will be much faster. So I tried a range of different parameterization from trapezoidal, sine trapezoidal, cosine trapezoidal, truncated sinusoidal, sinusoidal, harmonics, a range of different. I had a student at the time who was an MSc student and he really liked just tweaking these different sequences. And, and what we actually found was just a simple trapezoidal parameterization was the most effective. It gave a, a very, very similar result like the generalized waveforms. And it was very easy, it was kind of the easiest to um, accept and implement on the scanner. Um, so we just chose to stick with, the, with that particular parameterization. And I kind of moved on uh, 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 to the next step, which was to actually try to do an approximation of this waveform. Uh, and at that time, a new PhD student came to the lab, which was Andrade Janusz. And she was a PhD student of Daniel Alexander and mine. And she, that was her first task for her PhD. And she's here today. Uh, <laughs> um, and her first thing was to actually do this GPD approximation of the topic of the waveforms. Once she did that, then we could like, have analytical solutions and do some multiple fittings on loads of different voxels. So this was three years of worth of work. Three years of my postdoc. Publications that you can see all went to JMR. Callaghan was at the time editor of JMR. He really liked the work. <laughs> so we really liked sending it there. Uh, but also JMR contained many other papers on similar topics because Ozeslan and uh, Shemesh and, uh, and, uh, and Stepishnik and Callaghan were also publishing very similar material in JMR. So it seemed the most appropriate place to send this kind of material. So at that point, my reflection was, OK, we find these generalized waveforms provide uh, uh, more sensitivity than PGSC, we try these square waveforms and everything. So I thought I'm done. I'm going to go now to maternity leave and I'm going to come back and do some experiments. And then something happened. Enrique Carden came back, <laughs> came to our lab. So I came back after six months and Enrique came, was there. He started his postdoc then with uh, Danny and he gave this talk and he just saw this slide and he said, and the most sensitive sequence to use to estimate axon diameter is the fat PGSE. And I'm like, wait a second. I just thought it was like the, you know, the high oscillator, the high frequency OGCs that we want to use. And so I was really confused. And it seemed conflicting these results to our optimization results. So that then took lots of brainstorming. <laughs> Going back to the notebook, this is my version of the lab uh, book that somebody showed the other day. This was actually made on a computer, and we suggest, you know, this was done in 2012. Um, and so we went back to this uh, and did loads and loads of checks and, and, and tried to understand why suddenly now, the, you, know, the, why the P, you know, whether the fat PGSE is better than high frequency OGSE. And that I did this all with Andrade Janusz, and we found actually that that was indeed true. When we were optimizing our sequences for just one single parameter, we were always getting just the PGSC, and we never needed oscillations. We only needed oscillations when we were estimating both the axon diameter and diffusivity. Because then, the, those oscillations were actually capturing information 
from that short, uh, fast um, uh, time limit that Els was talking about earlier, because that was on that kind of curve, on that curve that she was showing, there was a curve where it was really bendy, the signal. So those high frequency oscillations were capturing that information so that the fitting could have more uh, information to fit and give the better prediction of the estimates. But that was basically not suggesting that the sensitivity to axon diameter was better with these OGSEs. So this now needed a completely new thorough investigation because like, and we really wanted to understand whether then the OGSC had any place in imaging axon diameters. So we, this is a dream team, it was me, Gary Zang, Andrade, Enrique, and Danny sat down and went back to real simple basics. So we looked at simply the signal of the diffusion and versus the axon diameter and we said, okay, if the signal does not change, if the axon diameter changes, it means the signal is not sensitive. And then we try to quantify the amount of change of the signal with respect to the change of this axon diameter. So what we then found is uh, that when the gradient is perpendicular to the fibers, then the PGSE was giving the best results. As you see this red curve, this PGSE is most sensitive and the sensitivity here you can see from just looking at the size of that slope so basically, the, the larger the slope, more chance you have to detect the small difference in the signal and then detect that there is a change in the axon diameter. But what is actually even more interesting is that this OGSC here, which is basically just like a you know, four-lobe PGSC, as me and Novik were discussing, this is not really an OGSC because it's not like a very high oscillating uh, sequence. Uh, but the OGSC was giving a very similar slope like this PGSC and had a B value which was 10 times lower. So we were achieving the same sensitivity to the axon diameter, but we were doing it much cheaper in terms of B value. And why was that important? It was because the minute the, per, the, per, the direction of the gradient changed, and we only had like a two degree offset from the fibers, the PGC with that massive B value just dropped, and there was not much signal left. While the OGSE, because it has so much lower B value, remained. So suddenly we found that OGSE can give us benefit in this way, which was completely new and separate from anything that was done before in temporal diffusion spectroscopy or anyway. It was just a completely new insight of why it can be useful. The same situation happened for dispersion, because here in dispersion as well, when the fibers are uh, dispersed, we also have a similar situation. And this is all coming from the fact that once the angle is not perpendicular, you are capturing the parallel water in the parallel direction, and that parallel water, if the B value is really large, will just go down to zero and really kill your signal. So we did this, uh, we've done this then really, really thoroughly uh, in numerically, through a large massive space, confirmed all these results for particular direction, angle variation, fiber dispersion, and we found, we identified the, and we addition to, and we found exactly the same situation. And then we actually looked at the resolution limit and we identified the smallest identifiable diameters and we found similarly to like what Dimitri was saying earlier, other people before us, that there is this fundamental um, issue with the gradient strength and the, and the size of the axon diameter that we can access and OGSC does not further that. It, it cannot improve on that result. So in parallel, uh, Marcus Nielsen was also independently have very similar ideas and worked on this completely from analytical perspective and theoretical perspective. And when we, one of one few drinks in, uh, <laughs> at UCL started chatting, we realized that we are working on similar things, which is he was, I was doing everything numerically and he was doing everything analytically. And we just kind of like joined strengths. And then uh, we, uh, we showed that uh, he showed exactly the same things. And uh, in numerically, we just validated all of the analytical uh, results that he had. So that was just recently accepted in the NMR in biomedicine. So at this point, um, you know, we were really happy. We found that RGSC can be useful. We then said, okay, what about some sc doing some scanning? I mean, all of this was just simulations. And it, I had a PhD student, uh, uh, Levina Shrecha, and she's done loads of different validations for using phantoms, capillaries, corpus callosum, rough sciatic nerve. Uh, this is just a... I want to show how the phantoms, the phantoms are so lovely, they look really nice, it's just a picture, but I'm not gonna show results about the phantom. 
I'm going to show just results that we got for the rat sciatic nerve study. We done it thoroughly, first in simulation uh, and using uh, uh, optimized sequences. This is on the left, the, the single diffusion encoding versus the OGSE. And uh, we found in simulation exactly the same thing as in the numerical results, that the OGSE, the low frequency OGSE, was giving more accurate and more precise results uh, for the axon diameter estimation. Um, we then uh, did some nerve imaging, proper nerve. We extracted a rat sciatic nerve from the leg. We kept it in this chamber created by Simon Richardson and so that uh, it can be uh, viable. So it was as close as in vivo for hours. So the diffusion properties of this nerve hasn't, haven't changed during scanning. We then did, did a real thorough histology uh, of that uh, rat, uh, rat sciatic nerve. And then we compared the estimates of the axon diameter with the histology. And what we found is that on the left was the, this uh, single diffusion encoding sequence was giving this uh, overestimation in axon diameter. And we found that the OGSE was matching really closely our histology results. Uh, and since we've been, this is done with 800 millitesla per meter. So the B values here are really large. So this is exactly the reason why these OGSE here are useful. It's just because when you have 32 directions in that kind of protocol, you are going to have a lot of angles between the fibers and the gradients. And then it's crucial to have a B value, which is just not too large. And simply because of that, OGC here does better than the PGC. Um, so this work is kind of like finishing up now. It was published in some way in Mika. It's now submitted to NeuroImage. And some monkey uh, corpus callosum stuff that we have been working on with Tim Derby is now currently in a preparation. Um, this is just um, a software that because Sarah asked me, do you have the software now, that matrix method formalism, that I implemented it from scratch at this. And uh, we do. It's called MIST. It's Microstream Imaging Sequence Simulation Toolbox. It's fully based on Callaghan's and Stepishnik's matrix method formalism method. And it can be done for a, a, any gradient waveform in 3D for any tissue model. We expanded it and worked on it. I mean, Andrade Janusz did an amazing work with this package. And since she, she came along, uh, she's really made it very modular and fantastic. This work was seen by Noam, and again, one of the chatting and conversation, Noam said, oh, it looks really great, but also your results about PGSE and OGSE. Can we use some of these OGSE for also the double diffusion encoding? So we used, so he, he, he had, it was a really nice idea. So we looked at uh, whether the OGSE in the same way can improve double diffusion encoding, and we found that actually they can. So these are just similar results where the OD also improves on the pore size estimation, while the DDE is still really valuable for eccentricity. So in combination, they create a perfect package, but no one will talk about that later on. Uh, so final remarks, uh, there were, in addition to this, many other directions in sequence development. As I mentioned, the temporal diffusion spectroscopy is still going strong, the DD is as well. And now we have these new um, works by, you know, fantastic works by Els and, and Dimitri on QT um, imaging, and later on you'll hear about fat B tensors. So I would say that there's, there have been great new discoveries since the taste Lantano sequence. I think the shape has definitely evolved. However, I believe we always come back to it as a gold standard, and it will still inform our new directions. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Are there any questions before we all go to coffee? All right. Maybe I missed it, but you optimize it for the certain axon diameter, but what happens? Have you ever tried to optimize it to the range of axonal uh, 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 sizes and diffusivities? Because in the real world, you don't know what you measure, True. and therefore you should be probably preferred, prepared for something that it's outside the, the normal values. Yes, so, so we haven't done in detail any of the kind of distribution of axon diameter or gamma distribution. I think it was mainly because even this work on just optimizing one single <laughs> axon diameter for optimizing one single axon diameter created so many questions and it took so much time to actually answer these questions and go in a direction that we haven't actually had a chance. But that's a fantastic question. I think that's the next kind of avenue to be explored. 
Um... Ivana, yeah. thanks very much. Exactly what I wanted you to talk about. But brilliant, thank you. Um, so, um, Ralph this morning showed the PNS and the cardiac limit, uh, stimulation limit in terms of rise times. And Umesh, that many people met on the tour uh, today in the Connectom scanner, has kind of keeps talking about this experiment where we skirt the edge of the stimulation threshold. So rather than, because parts of that curve you can actually play with, you could actually get a bit closer than, than saying, um, okay, we can't rise above a certain time because there's a sort of gradient strength. I'm just wondering if your optimization framework, if we found volunteers brave enough to go in, would allow us to, you know, can it cope with an additional constraint that says you can operate just up to this threshold and it's variable so that we can be, mm -hmm. you know, 10% below the stimulation threshold, but maxing out as much as possible? No, it's, it's a great question. And uh, really one wonderful thing about the optimization is that you can uh, set those kind of parameters in. I mean, you first kind of start from the scanner and what the scanner can do, and then you can include those parameter ranges and you can include the space that you want to be looking in and where mm. the limits are, and you can then play with that and definitely include. So it's, well, uh, Umesh suggested the idea, so Umesh will be volunteer number one. <laughs> 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 Thank you.